everybody. Well, for the past two weeks, we've been feeding a flock of uh, just over a hundred American goldfinches, pine siskins, red poles, one purple finch, and that's all mixed in with our resident birds like chickadees, jays, two cardinals, uh, nut hatches, and woodpeckers. So things have been rather busy here. And today there is a snowstorm outside, so the feeders are covered in birds. And as you can see, some of my feeders are almost empty. I'm doing this on purpose, actually. I'm waiting for the birds to eat all the seed, and then I'm gonna take the feeders down and I'm going to wash them. So this is just a quick reminder that if you have a lot of birds on your bird feeders and under your bird feeders, you have to wash your feeders more frequently. On a regular basis, you should wash your feeders once a month, but when you have the traffic that I do, it has to be at least once a week or even more often to keep everyone healthy. So the recommended way to wash your feeders is to soak them in a 1 to 10 bleach solution for 15 minutes. Don't do it for more. Uh, and then rinse them and wash them well and let them air dry before filling them. Greg Weil would like to know if owls have any significant sense of taste or smell. Hi Greg. There certainly are critters out there like the short-tailed shrew which are able to survive being eaten by predators because of the bad taste or perhaps even smell associated with them. Insects also come immediately to mind. To answer your question though about whether owls can smell or taste, I consulted a wonderful recently published book reviewing bird senses by expert Graham Martin. In the book though, I could find precious little information to indicate that owls have been studied much in either regard. The author basically concluded that taste capabilities in birds in general are no better or worse than mammals. But to be truthful, it's been poorly studied to date. We do know though that almost all birds can smell to some degree, with some like the turkey vulture being the world's experts with this sense. And we even learned recently that tiny hummingbirds can smell too. But data on olfaction in owls is almost non-existent, except to say that you could go on the internet and find plenty of sites claiming that owls are not able to smell and thus great horned owls can eat all those smelly skunks with great relish. However, one could turn that around and claim that those same owls might just be able to smell well enough to locate skunks in the forest at night by their odor. I was actually going to study that question at my avian research center at McGill University decades ago, but never got around to it. Overall, one has to consider the size of an owl's brain. There's only so much brain that can fit into their skulls and thus only so much of that brain that can be devoted to each of the five main senses. In other words, the hearing and eyesight capabilities of owls are so special and well developed that it might mean a wee bit of sacrifice in brain dedication to the departments of taste and smell. But at this point, who really knows? It certainly is an avenue of research worth pursuing. Today's environment is will apply mostly for people who live in the same latitude as us. Uh, with the snowstorm outside, we thought we'll talk about snowblowers. Did you know that a snowblower releases one pound of greenhouse gases per hour? So if you can, please try shoveling your driveway. Shoveling is actually a very good exercise as long as you push the snow and don't lift it, or if you really have to lift it, please remember to put your feet in the same direction as your shovel. And then of course, another option is hiring snow clearing services because that's just one engine running instead of multiple snow blowers. Just the mere presence of predators in one's breeding territory can apparently have very subtle but devastating effects on a bird population. For instance, there are those who suggest that the growing numbers of Cooper's hawks out there may be driving smaller birds of prey, American kestrels in particular, out of habitats where they used to commonly breed. The former's populations are increasing big time because we banned harmful organochlorine pesticides and they also love to breed in green spaces in our cities. As for kestrels, we're seeing less of them. It seems that the Cooper's hawks have demonstrated a taste for kestrels in their diet. Try to look at it this way. If you could purchase a really nice house for a highly affordable price, but you were told that there were plenty of velociraptors lurking about the neighborhood, would you buy it? I didn't think so. Well, it turns out that a fear of predators can be enough to have a bird population in just four years, according to a recent study. 
Over three breeding seasons, Leanna Zanette and her husband Michael Clinchy of Western University in Ontario hung speakers from trees in 104 territories of song sparrows breeding on five of the smaller Gulf Islands on the British Columbia coast. Half of the speakers played vocal calls of predators like hawks, raccoons and ravens, while the other half emitted uh, calls of harmless species like Canada geese. All of the sparrow nesting sites were protected from real predators with electric fences and nets. So it was just the calls of the predators that they heard. The bottom line, the latter birds hearing the predator sounds uh, raised only half as many young as the ones not exposed to the scary calls. And simply put, the constantly frightened birds had to spend more time looking out for the non-existent predators as opposed to finding food for their mates and their young. And they also didn't lay as many eggs overall and their more poorly fed young were not as robust. After four years of breeding in that kind of environment, a sparrow population can be cut in half. Whether the results of this study can be applied to all other forms of life on earth ranging from insects to elephants that have to fear predators, including of course the most dangerous predator of all, we humans, remains to be seen. In Quebec, we know that winter is here when dark-eyed juncos arrive to stay with us for the colder months. In the winter, dark-eyed juncos can actually be seen everywhere in the United States and lower Canada. And then in early spring, they move further north in Canada for the breeding season. Dark-eyed juncos used to be actually five different species, well, because they do look so different in different geographical areas. Check this out. These are dark-eyed juncos by Steve Swearingen in Texas. And these pictures were taken by Dan Hutchinson in British Columbia. So a lot of people do think that these are different birds, but one thing they all have in common are their dark eyes. Both sexes look the same, pretty much similar, but in some of those geographical subspecies, females can be paler and brownish comparing to the males. For years, I would only see dark-eyed juncos either under our bird feeders, under our pine trees or the cedar hedge. You know, their diet is seeds and uh, insects like spiders, ticks, uh, millipedes, centipedes, uh, flies. But then one winter, I decided to put up a niger feeder in front of my kitchen window and uh, not only did I get goldfinches, but juncos were eating at the feeder as well. I was absolutely shocked. So then I decided to take to social media and I asked our followers if they'd ever experienced something like this. And these are the pictures that we received as a response to our post. So I guess it's not that uncommon. Let me know what juncos are like in your backyard. During their breeding season, males become very territorial and will chase off any male in the area, though no fistfights have been recorded so far. Once mated, the pairs stay pretty much monogamous for the rest of the season. Females choose the nesting sites and they build the nest. They like anything with a cover above. So something like a, a sloping road, anything under buildings, flower pots, window ledges, stuff like that. She lays on average four eggs and she incubates all by herself, though males do stick around to protect the nest because chipmunks are their arch enemy. Males also help feed the young. Chicks fledge when they're about 11, 12 days old, but they are still not able to feed themselves until they're about 25 days old. Time to say goodbye. Please keep your feeders clean and filled if you have lots of birds. And our photo contest is still open. It's showing off my best side. Take care, everyone. I'll see you in two weeks.